So just uh, just a second. Okay, uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? Yep. Excellent. Hello, everybody. My name is Petri Lipponen. I can't really, it's a bit confusing to see my own picture on the on the big screen in front of me. So if there I can change the, the chat window or something. And let's start. I'm a short introduction first. Uh, I am the lead software developer, uh, lead software engineer of the MoveSense project. And uh, for those of uh, you who have been uh, dealing with MoveSense for a few years, you might already know me, but the rest of you just think of me as the mother of all bugs. So if you find a bug, it's my handwriting most probably, or some, or at least behind me when it comes to the bugs. Of course, we try to get rid of them as fast as they are found, so that's a good thing. But let's see. I'm trying to find my presentation. And how to share it in this thing. Uh, yes. Um, it's this one. Let's see if it comes to the screen. Yes, it does. Excellent. Technology that works. That's amazing thing. But yeah, basically, we are having the Moves and Sensor programming session today. Tomorrow will be the Moves and Mobile programming. So today we only deal with the mobile things when it comes in relation to the sensor programming. So we are not looking into the detailed mobile stuff today. But let's anyway see. See and let's get to the point. First of all, uh, I've divided this content to kind of maybe 10 different sections. Feel free to interrupt me with the chat. I have the chat on the on the big screen so that I can see the questions and then I can input me if I if I miss something. First of all, I'll have a short introduction on what is MoveSense. Most of you probably already know this, but there might be some new people who don't. So let's get kind of a top-down, high-level uh, idea on what we are dealing with. Then some details about our MoveSense sensor. Then uh, how to set up the programming environment, which has now changed with our 2.0 release, which came last winter. Uh, I'll show you kind of basically uh, show it live on the screen on how it's uh, how to deal how to deal with the build environment and so on. Then some uh, basics about uh, sensor programming. Uh, what you should know when you go to the sensor programming. Then about the Moosens REST API, which we think is about the thing that mostly sets us apart from other sensors. And now I lost the screen. And the then comes the uh, how to use the data memory inside the sensor. Then something uh, small things about security considerations because, well, obviously you as a customers you have your own sec security considerations to take care of when you make your solution. I'll give you a couple of hints and tips and how to deal with those and what you can do and what is already available in the framework. Then one section about the alternative communication methods. We'll find out about the kind of main communication method while we are going through this presentation. 
but there are a couple of alternatives that you can use as well. And they come in handy in different kinds of situations. And then one of the wishes from the, when you signed up was using multiple sensors. There are different things that uh, you have to take into account, different ways you can deal with it. And uh, I'll go through a few of those. And then, of course, the most important part, the questions and answers, because uh, it is really difficult to have a presentation and tell what you should learn. It's much better that you tell me what is in your mind and what is what are the questions that you're facing, and I'll try to answer them the best I can. So let's see. What is MoveSense? We have a very short slogan from our website. It's open wearable tech platform, which is a lot, a very, very, very high level description. Basically, what we have is a programmable sensor, mobile SDKs, uh, embedded REST communication framework, we call whiteboard. And then we have a bunch of physical accessories that are available for you to use or for you to develop your own based on the, the CAD drawings and so on that we can provide and the measurements and so on. This is the high level thing, meaning sensor plus SDKs plus so on and so on. At the moment, we only have one sensor hardware or actually already two since we have the medical variant, but that's almost identical. Uh, hopefully in the future we have more, but that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. And then the, here is kind of high level drawing. We have the sensor, which you have probably seen is the small round thingy. And it talks to the mobile phone device, which in this case is very, very generic idea on some kind of Mobile device, uh, talking Bluetooth low energy, 4.0 and higher standard. We support Bluetooth 5.0 standard internally in the MoveSense sensor with the current framework. For different kind of sub protocols on top of the Bluetooth, we have the whiteboard REST API protocol, which basically brings you the very uh, common REST. Uh, approach which is used all over the internet services it brings it to you on the uh, on the on the embedded world because we are talking about devices that don't have enough memory to run for example the internet protocol so this is our own embedded protocol that runs on top of very low resources and can provide what is needed there then you can always use the GAT which is a kind of generic Bluetooth uh, uh, client server, client service architecture. And then, of course, we provide the possibilities of accessing the Bluetooth advertising, uh, which can be used in many cases. And that is also chosen later on. We are uh, shown some cases there. OK, let's get to the actual nitty gritty details of our sensor. We are, first of all, we are waterproof, 30 meters, as in the back cover, powered by coin cell battery, which means very low energy consumption. Despite that, we have very high performance, 64 megahertz processor, MCU there, which has 64 kilos of RAM and 512 kilos of flash available. So very high powering and uh, full floating point unit, or at least a single precision floating point. Uh, sorry about, I'm having this phone keeps blinking out, but the donut is there. Then uh, when it comes to the sensors in our, inside, inside our moves and sensor, we have the nine axis IMU inertial measurement unit which contains a 3D accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer uh, chips. 
which enables you to measure uh, rotational uh, movement, acce acceleration, magnetic fields, basically everything that you need to do, any kind of motion sensing, you can do with that. In addition to that, we have the Maxim ECG analog front end. We often call it uh, shorthand AFE from analog front end, which can measure ECG, heart rate, RR intervals, and it also provides us the start contact detection for waking up the sensor. Then we have the data memory built in, uh, full 384 kilos of it, which is EEPROM, um, more of that a bit later. We have temperature sensor there, capability uh, which measures the sensor bulk temperature basically because it's on the PCB, not the surface temperature or anything like that. And then we have a one wire master on the non-medical variant only. Medical variant, this has been removed for standard uh, for certification is, uh, reasons, which provides us the smart connection, connector detection and one wire communication support. Uh, let's see. Then to the actual sensor programming environment. When we started developing the whole sensor, we thought that, oh, it would be really cool if the customers could program the sensor themselves to do the tricks that they wanted to do. And uh, that is something that we aim to do. And then pretty soon after that, we realized that, oh, if the customers are going to do it, it has to be simple to use. And we had this uh, idea that if you have a, the stuff downloaded to your computer so you don't have to wait for the internet, you should have everything running and the firmware compiled in five minutes. And we actually already demonstrated that pretty much four years ago. With the uh, MoveSense uh, device library version 2.0, we improved this in the sense that we are no longer limited by what the customers can or cannot uh, really install on their computer, different kinds of environments and operating systems and so on. We moved the whole programming environment to be in the Docker containerized platform, container platform, which helps us in the sense that we have the tools already prepackaged and you just run the container and compile your thing. So we have the Docker based build environment available in the Docker hub if people are, if you are aware of it. If not, it, it basically it just automatically downloads the environment when you ask for it. Inside the Docker, we have a couple of uh, commands that you need to know. One is the CMake. That is our uh, build project uh, system, which basically tells how our sensor software is built. And then we use the command Ninja uh, to actually build the thing. Ninja is a build tool similar to the old uh, GNU make tool. With the Ninja tool, basically Ninja, uh, the CMake generates the Ninja files and Ninja builds you the firmware. And if you use the Ninja PKGS uh, command, that means that you get the hex files for factory flashing or for flashing for your programming jig and you get the uh, firmware update packages for flashing the sensor over the over the air using your mobile phone. Here's a link also to more details. We have our documentation in the movesense.com slash docs and uh, there is a setting uh, section for how to set up the tools chain and how to use them. But basically, uh, yep. Now I'll show it you live. Let's hope that it works and we don't get the demo effect. Uh, oh, where is my mouse? There. Let's see. I'll share the whole screen now. Uh, 
I have made here on my desktop a folder called demo. Can everybody see this, by the way? Is it visible? Yeah, good. OK, yeah, this, I can see it on the TV. Too many screens. Here I have basically only cloned the latest MoveSense device library on the Bitbucket. I have nothing else here. What I'm going to do here next is that I'm going to create myself a build folder. I like to mark, uh, start them with underscores so that they're easily recognizable. And then I have here the window where I will open my Docker build environment in a terminal mode. Mm -hmm. I've already set up the the comment here. Look at it. It's right here. It tells that I want to run a Docker container. I want it so that it's cleaned up afterwards. I want it as an inter interactive terminal. And then this dash V tells that I want this folder here, which is my demo folder here that I just showed. I want it shared or mounted to the Docker container in the path slash move sense. And this tells in the Mac that it's uh, it caches the files a bit so that it's not really slow. In Windows and Linux, the Docker file sharing is very fast, absolutely no problem. In Mac, it's a bit slower, and that one helps it a bit. Then I have here dash w slash move sense, which tells that, okay, start in the folder slash move sense. And this here is our build environment. And if you don't specify the tag, it takes the tag latest, which is our current, current thing. So let's run and see how it goes. That was pretty fast. I didn't have to download it because I've done it before. If, if I would not have it in this computer before, have used that container, then it would download it from the Docker Hub automatically. But basically, now we are running in our build environment. If I take here, I can see in the slash move sense, I can see exactly these files here that I had in my demo folder. And since we are going to build something, let's choose first what we are going to build and go see what is available in the MoveSense device library. Let's put it as a list. It's nicer to look. Okay. Basically, here we have a couple of folders. There's the MoveSense core lib, core lib which is, um, uh, contains everything that, you, that the framework will have. There's uh, all kinds of files here that you really don't need to know much about. One thing that you might want to know about is under resources. We'll look at it a bit later. There's the MoveSense API folder under resources, and this contains our sensor API that will come in a moment. But that's under core library. Then we have mechanics, which has something handy for you, like uh, accessory cat drawings or sensor cat drawings and electrical interface information, that kind of stuff. And for the programmer, important part is the tools. We have WBCMD, which is usable if you are talking to the sensor over the serial port using our programming jig. Let me show, uh, let me see if I can show it somehow. Well, Mm -hmm. Here I have my, I decided that this is maybe the easiest way to show it. I'm using my phone as a camera. 
So basically it comes with the J-Link Sager. I have the Ultra Plus, but the usual one comes with the OEM version. And then the actual jig, which has the possibility of attaching move sense sensor. And uh, then you can have it here. It provides power programming pins and over this cable, it also provides the serial port. So the, the W, B, C, and D can then, can then uh, uh, talk to the sensor using the whiteboard protocol. So that is something that you may want to use if you have the jig. Using the jig is not necessary. If you have a big project and you need heavy sensor programming, it makes the debugging easier. And you can, uh, you're flashing faster and so on. Another part where you need the WBCMD command is when you use the sensor simulator that we'll have in a moment. And then the important part is the samples, which contains all our sample code here. And let's go for the classic and they choose the Blinky app. So to create it, let's first CD to the build folder. For now, it is an empty file. And then we use the CMake, tell it to generate ninja files. CMake toolchain file is something that has to be defined or or it will not do it, then it wants to have the moves and score library location, which is the moves and score lib under the um, Git repository. And then in the end, we want to have the path to the sample, to the project folder, which in this case is the sample link it up. Uh, samples, Link. Hit enter. CMake crunches for a while. By default, if you don't specify anything else, it will create the debug build. Debug build uh, has less free memory. It uses more flash. Git bitbucket org. Okay, could be something in the. We have a question in the chat that somebody got the. Uh, permission denied for the Git. There should be some kind of a network thing that prevents SSH. I know that I cannot do it over the internal company guest network. We are blocking the SSH for some reason. But yeah, so now the CMake part is done. And if we look at here in the folder, in the build folder, The, the CMake has now generated quite a bit of stuff here. Some files that uh, came, or the folders that got gen generated, and the files, that the build ninja, which the ninja then used to build the thing. Now let's run the ninja PKGS here and And we are doing, going, going, going. The linking part takes a while usually. Um, and we are ready. Something that you might want to, especially when you're optimizing or, uh, or keeping track on how big your software is, here is something that is kind of important, is the application size. This will tell how big the actual application portion of your firmware is. Of course, that is not the only thing that goes to the sensor. There's also the bootloader and there's the, the soft device, which is the Nordic Semiconductor's Bluetooth stack. So those will be there as well. So not the, all 512K is for your, your app. And then some other things here. 
but that's the important part, the application size. It will give you an error if it's too big. Now, if we look at the build folder, here came moves and combine.hex, which is the Intel hex format presentation of the firmware file. Uh, when you're ordering us, uh, sensors from us, from the factory with your own firmware and stickers and so on in larger quantities, this is the file that the production will want because then the factory can flash them for you. Then here's a couple of intermediate files that were you, uh, this one for example was used in the earlier versions but the current ones do not work. Only this one is important. And then the DFU packages, we have two of them here. One is the MoveSense DFU.zip, the other one is DFU with bootloader. Difference being that if you flash sensor which has older bootloader, you have to use the with bootloader zip. Otherwise, you can use this one. Since the version 2.0 just got the new bootloader, if you have sensors which are 1.9, you have to flash them with this one when you do it. Now, I will demonstrate with this one. Uh, I'll get the screen. Mm, open the. How can I get it here? Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'll take the DFU with bootloader. Oh. Copy. And let's hope that the phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not handy. How can I get them? Get it to the phone. Great, I cannot move it there. I'll show you with some other with some other DFU that I already have on my. How come this has different screen than my phone? Really? Huh. Okay, the screen viewing is not working. Let's try again. We choose the DFU here. Select the file. Mm -hmm. And of course, I don't have here anything of use. Sorry about this. I have to transfer it using some other method. This does not work. But yeah, basically you choose a, a file here. I don't have anything su suitable here. You select the device, which in this case is uh, Um. As I was saying, I thought that I was connected. First, you select the file, being the zip file that you have moved to your phone, which I don't have. I do have an old one, but I cannot, since that sensor already has 2.0, I cannot go backwards in the, uh, to the older bootloader. 
Then you select the device, which I think I had the 410, like this. And since I don't have file, it says that the file is corrupted. And then it would connect to it and tell what sensor version is there and choose and give you an old kind of, do you really want to update the firmware? We can try to do it so that the, we get the, I can show it later on. But that's basically how it goes. It's not complicated as such. It's just, just needs to be the data transfer done to the so that I can get the file to the phone, which I don't have on this phone and this map anymore. I just upgrade, uh, updated my computer, so things are lost. Let's continue. Basically, with these, then flashing the sensor, then you would have the sensor running on the on the flash mode. Then if you want to see how the jig is running, then RTT viewer with the jig then demonstrates you and gives you the the now I'm taking Bluetooth connection to the sensor and as you can see on the screen there's a there's things happening on the sensor. And you can get all kinds of low, low level stuff coming from the debug build of the of the firmware if you use the jig and the and the Sager devices. But that's it. That's how the thing is done. Now how to flash it over jig for that you have to use a separate window. I can I'm on the wrong folder. Let's go to the build folder. And here we use Nordic's program called NRFJ Prog. Just combined hex. And we want to reset afterwards. And let's see if this works. I'm putting you on this on the screen. Let's put it here and let's flash it. And pretty soon we should have the lid blinking over there when it has done the programming. And there we have it. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, Esther wanted me to confirm that the whole point of the Blinky app is just to blink. There's nothing else. But it, as all the others, it has our full firm, uh, framework stack inside it. So you can still access all the accelerometers, the data memories, and so on from the mobile phone if you wish. Just because the uh, firmware itself doesn't do anything doesn't mean that there's nothing available. But let's see. I'm trying to go back to the. Let's see, where was it? This one. I hope it remembers. Of course, it does not. We went through the sensor programming, uh, the build demo. Now everybody should have some kind of idea on how the environment works. We tried to make it as simple as possible. That was basically the goal. And if there are things that we think you think that can be improved, please let us know so that we can make it easier for everybody. Some basics about the sensor programming. 
Uh, first of all, the language that is used on the sensor is C, C++. Uh, that is because there really isn't much memory available and anything more higher level would be using the little memory that we have. There are some limitations, like no dynamic memory allocation. There is a way, but it's not the kind of normal way of operating. And that means no STL. The STL classes tend to use quite a lot of memory allocation. And there is very limited amount of RAM memory and flash memory. Since those are limited, that means that you have to pay attention on how you handle your data, how you do your algorithms and so on. The good news is that there's quite a bit of CPU power. So the CPU, while it uses battery, but it is really efficient. So uh, unless you start to do something really heavy on the sensor, it will not use many percent CPU. Then all the hardware and, and low level access on the sensor is done by our MoveSense REST API. We have abstracted everything behind uh, this kind of a very standard internet service style APIs, which use the standard get, post, put, delete verbs. And there's a question from Janne that can we use STL that doesn't allocate memory on the heap? Yes, it should work. I have not done it because it's really cumbersome to try to avoid that. And you have to have your own allocators and so on. It's just much easier to do them very low level stuff and not worry about it. About the REST APIs, uh, in addition to the standard get, post, put, delete, uh, there is a publish, subscribe extension that we use for the data streams. That means that uh, there are certain uh, services, uh, certain resources that we call subscription, and you subscribe to those, and then as, as soon as the service has something to update, then it will give you a notification. You'll get an event that, hey, I have new data. Hey, I made a new temperature measurement, etc. Which is a pretty handy way uh, to deal with things so that you don't have to keep polling for services to see if there's new data available or anything like that. And then the important thing is that the same API, thanks to our whiteboard communication framework, is used inside the sensor in C, C++ and from mobile using our MDS uh, library, which is the mobile library that we offer. That means that you can try to do things with the mobile first, and when you know how things are used and done, then you can do it on the sensor almost with very little changes. Of course, the, the appearance of the code changes because it's C, C++, but uh, it's very easy to do. In some ways, it's even easier in the C++ because our build system builds this kind of uh, uh, all the classes and data types for you already. So you don't have to worry about JSON all around. In the mobile side, everything shows up as a JSON, just like in normal REST, uh, uh, REST services in the internet. And then, Thanks to our get, post, put, delete APIs, MoveSense APIs, uh, everything is fully asynchronous. There are a couple of uh, things that you, that causes is that the code must not hog the execution. So you can't have a busy loop somewhere because that will prevent the sensor from working. The good things that come with that is that we have fully automatic uh, power optimization, meaning you, do, you deal with the data that comes you do your trick, you expose the data forward in your own service, and the power optimization is taken care of, and the sensor uses just enough power to do the job and nothing else. And in CC++, this one is handled as a call callback structure. You will have separate callback. Uh, uh, there's Alberto asking if there's uh, if you can have it in non-real time. Yes, uh, 
you can do that using the data, uh, the data memory. I'll, I'll show a bit later. So basically, it's fully asynchronous. You have to get used to it, but it's relatively simple. We have sample code that you can look at and try to see how it's done. Some samples are simple. There are some more difficult ones and more complicated ones, and the logic can get complicated, but it's still the basic structure is, is relatively straightforward. Then about, I've already mentioned the whiteboard frame and communication framework a couple of times. Basically, uh, here's a list of what it does and has and so on, but basically it's soon the internal framework for dealing with the rest on embedded devices. That's the kind of short. And it provides you services, just like web server, clients, just like HTTP client, timers, threading support inside the sensor, and external communication to the mobile devices or over the serial port if you use the JIG. We have a thing called execution context, which are whiteboard aware threads. Uh, they, at, by default, there's two of them. There's measurement thread and application thread. Measurement thread is much more real time needed because some sensors really need to be handled fast. Then we have a thing called launchable module, uh, which is kind of whiteboard aware class. It runs in an execution context, which is the whiteboard thread, and it has lifecycle callbacks, init module, start module, stop module, de init module. Then we have a resource provider, which is kind of whiteboard REST service. Uh, and here comes the neat thing. The API that you create for your whiteboard service is defined using the Swagger 2.0 notation, just like any internet web REST server or REST service. So if you're familiar with the, how internet REST services are done, you, uh, it's very easy to continue here. It's done in a YAML file. You describe the service API and the build system generates everything else for you. And how the requests are handled, you'll get the request callbacks to your resource provider derived class. There's like on get request, on put request, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have resource client, which is the whiteboard REST client, kind of counterpart for that, which you will use to make requests to internal and external whiteboard services. Of course, it doesn't make much sense to make calls from sensor to the mobile phone. That is very rarely needed thing. Typically, you want to do it the other, other way around. So what you usually do is that you just use it to make calls to your uh, to your own REST services or the framework provided REST services, which will be, I'll list a bit later. And the request methods are called async get, async put, just to ma make sure to kind of emphasize the fact that they're asynchronous methods. And you'll get the answers as on get response, on put response, and so on. Both resource provider and resource client provide the timer interface so that you can use a timer on each of them. Okay, then let's continue. Something about the project structure. How does it look? And I need to... Okay, let's go through here first. I'll show them a bit later when it comes to the Blinky, for example. First of all, there's a CMake list TXT. That's the main project file for CMake. And that's what the CMake uses to create you the project structure and the build files and so on, so that it can be built. Another important file is the app CPP which lists the modules that the user application will do, modules being the launchable modules that, were, that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, it tells which optional framework modules do you want in your app. If you don't want them, they don't take any flash space. 
and they don't take run. If you take them in, they use both. And in that file also, there are a couple of macros that can be used to define the data memory layout for the data memory use. Then there's AppRoot YAML, which basically has the execution context definitions, which have uh, queue lengths and that kind of stuff. Uh, that's uh, typically you don't have to touch those unless you run out of timers or that kind of things. Another thing is that it contains all the user's own API declarations, and that is something that you do want if you make your own service. And then when it comes to the services, there's a folder called WB resources, and that contains the APIs that your application has defined. Let me show you. Uh, the screen I have here. No, not that one. Where was it? Demo. Yeah, here we have it. I'm using Visual Studio Code. This is a very handy editor for this kind of work. So let's see on the samples. Let's see the Blinky. Blinky is easy in the sense that it, it only uses the client, and it doesn't provide any services of its own. We have the CMake lists txt. It's a very short file nowadays. A uh, couple of definitions and that's pretty much it. Then the app CPP. Here you have a application stack size. Don't touch this unless you're really getting low on memory and you need to optimize it. This changes uh, the application's thread. Here are the list of the launchable modules that the that the user's application is uh, wants to use. In here, we have the Blinky client, which is defined in this application. Then moves and features contains the list of optional core modules that you want. Here we have data logger, logbook, let service, indication service, PLE, EEPROM, then system memory, and many of the others. Not everything is enabled, but so. And here in the bottom is the data memory. This will I will show you a bit later. And the name of the application, the version of your application, and your own company. This information is then available for the mobile apps when they require and query the, the sensor. Then uh, AppRoot YAML. Basically, in this case, it's very simple. It has just the section execution context where it lists the two threads that have to be there and in this order. So don't touch that. The easiest way to get your own application is, of course, just take a copy of a sample app and start modifying that. It doesn't have to be underneath the same folder or anything like that. It can basically be anywhere as long as you don't have space characters inside the, in the path name. For some reason, not all the environments like that. And when it comes to the services that I told, let's take a simplest service that we have. We have Hello World app. Here, if we now look at the AppRoot YAML, we have a new section down here. Oh, it gets all blurry. Basically, APIs, and you list kind of expression that defines which file names are kind of pattern that matches the, your API file names. You give it an API ID above 100, and you tell what is the default execution context for that API. And here in the WB resources, we have Hello World YAML, which is basically matches this part here. And this is your Swagger 2.0 uh, for our new defined API. 
here we have a couple of paths defined, samples slash hello world, which has a get, which gives you the hello world answer. And then we also demonstrate the use of the subscription. So we made sample hello world subscription, which then has this kind of post and delete. And here we have X notification extended value, which tells, OK, what kind of event value are you getting if you subscribe to this resource? And this basically, in the case of Hello World, it basically just starts a one second timer and gives you Hello World once a second. And here in the end, we have the data definition. So here we have hello world value, which has one property called greeting, which is a string and it contains the greeting. Let's go back. And uh, no, not there. Go up there. Mm -hmm. has to be a better way to do this. Let's see. Yeah, this was the project structure that we just went through. Now about the Moosness REST API. It's split in a few different sections. And uh, and they should be relatively straightforward and you can always look at them in the place where I showed you earlier. For convenience, I put here the path to the straight to the Bitbucket, to the folder and to the part of the Bitbucket repository which has the API definition files. There's the subject MEAS for measurement, which has all the sensor data. There's accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, and if you want combination of those, there's a separate IMU, which then gives either accelerometer and gyro, accelerometer and magnetometer, or all three at the same time. It makes many algorithms easier because you get them from the same source. There's the temp for temperature, HR for heart rate and RR interval values, and ECG for getting the ECG data from the analog front end. Then there's slash mem for memory access. A memory access in this case being the data memory access. And there we have two services called data logger and logbook. I'll get more to those in a moment when we get to the. Oh, we're already that late. Excellent. And then com for communication protocols, BLE and OneWire at the moment. Slash component for low level features like LED, EEPROM access, or some specific, specific features. System for system features, there's the system mode, like uh, whether it's application or firmware update. Uh, settings, uh, energy, aka battery level, some uh, memory information, and then thing called states, which is kind of low level. Um, how do you say it? It's a service that provides simple state information, like whether the connectors are connected to fingers or not, or whether the sensor is moving, or whether there was a double tap, and that kind of thing. Slash UI for user interface stuff, in our case, blinks. That's the indication, which is simple LED blinks. And then miss for the miscellaneous stuff that did not fit in any of the above. And there we have the gear ID, which is just the one, up, one wire identification of the smart connector. Then whiteboard has its own slash whiteboard, where the whiteboard's own services are, where they exist. Then uh, more information about the, uh, all the services under the MEAS. Any service that provides any kind of fast data that has a sample rate. Uh, IMUs, easy, basically. They have the same pattern. There's the MEAS something info, 
which provides you what are the valid sample rates and what are the valid sen sensitivity values. Then there's MEAS something something config where you set and get the current setting uh, of the sensitivity values and configuration. That is chip wide configuration. And then you have the MEAS something something sample rate and sample rate is given as a number which then you subscribe to and it gives you the data on the given sample rate. Then in many of the services, the data is bundled a few samples per notification. Just to save the BLE bandwidth and the processing speed on the sensor. So for example, if you order 104 Hertz accelerometer, then the end result is not 104 notifications per second. It bundles eight, eight, not, eight samples in one notification and gives them once every thir uh, 13 times a second. And just a small note that when you subscribe somewhere, the slash subscribe from the YAML file is not given. You just subscribe to MEAS ACC 13. But yeah, that was the API. Now how to get it, how to use the APIs, you can of course just subscribe to those from the mobile side. As I said, all the APIs are available on the mobile. But we have here the, in the sensor also a small amount of data memory that can be used to store the data there, even when there's no VLE connection. It's uh, in a current sensor, it's uh, two chips of EEPROM, total of 384 kilos. That's very low power consumption and maximum speed of about 400 kilobits per second. The thing is that uh, if you think, if you're trying to save something really fast data stream like 400 Hertz IMU, it will probably clog that data pipe and things will crash. But that is, uh, that's, those are the limitations. Then on the high level access, you can have the MEM data logger for storing any subscribable data. Uh, there are some limitations like you cannot store strings and if you have many arrays in, a, in an object, they have to be the same length. But basically all the internal ones and any of the user services that you create can be stored into the data memory. Then we have the MEM logbook for getting it back. And the storage is done in a binary format called STEM. Uh, and it is conceptually a ring buffer in the current sensor, which means that as soon as the memory is full, it will start overwriting from the beginning your oldest data. And if you use the mobile library, the MDS, it has automatic logbook proxy service which has a built-in spam to JSON conversion. So you just ask the proxy service. We'll get more to that tomorrow. You just ask it that, okay, give me this log and it will give you a JSON file. Then to access the, uh, the EEPROM memory on a low level, you have the component slash EEPROM and then uh, as a part, you give it a chip ID number or chip number. And that, that way you can allocate in a memory setup, uh, do I have it I have here? Okay, I don't know if I. On the right side, you see the logbook memory setup in app CPP. You define it, which address does it start, and how many bytes will it have? So, if you don't want, if you want to save, let's say, 256 bytes in the beginning for your own application data, you can do that. Put the logbook memory starting from 256 and then have the size 384 kilos minus 256. And that way you can access some part of the memory with the EEPROM. You can access all the part of the memory over the component EEPROM anyways. Just have to remember that the logbook will overwrite some portion of it. Uh, the APIs for data logger and logbook can be found in the YAML files that I showed earlier. Uh, data logger is very simple. You just give it the configuration that I want to save these parts, like MAS ACC 13 or MAS temp 
or something. And then it has a state variable that says that go into running mode. When you put it to running mode, it subscribes to those resources for you. You don't have to do anything. It subscribes and starts recording the data that it gets. And then you stop it. And it is available for you. We have more information about that in the Moosens docs uh, that has more details on how it is used and so on. The best way to find out how it's done, how it's used, is to go to the our mobile library. There's the in the Android samples, there's the sample called data logger sample, which is also available in the download section as an installation package. So you can just install that on an Android phone and try out how the data logger works. Let's see. For security consideration, I have a feeling that I skipped something earlier. It must have been the simulator work. Simulator stuff. Oh, yeah. For the security stuff on the sensor, we have Bluetooth bonding available on the on the sensor, which means that the connection will get encrypted. There's two uh, bonding models that can be used. The just works. That's actually its actual name, or the pin code. Officially, the pin code is not allowed in the UI less devices, but everybody uses them by having some kind of factory set pin code. But the just works is equally safe when it comes to the encryption. You can have adjustable policy whether you allow or deny rebonding of the same sensor from different sources. The BLE keys that are negotiated during the bonding process are stored in the internal flash memory in the system settings. So they are not available for reading from EEPROM or something. And then uh, there's an adjustable rebonding timeout after the power up. So that if, let's say, you drop your phone on, in the lake, uh, and that was the phone that you had bonded with, just take the battery out of the sensor, put the power back on, and then there's a certain timeout that is adjustable that you can then bond to a different device after inserting a new battery. One thing is that when doing the firmware update, there's the package signature, firmware package signature, which uh, kind of guarantees that the, that the firmware package goes correctly onto the sensor when it's been uploaded. Uh, we are coming up in version 2.1, we are coming up with customer specific keys so that the bootloader is fixed to a specific customer application or customer or their solution so that you cannot then uh, update over the firmware anybody else's, any other firmware on it. But that is coming, we are working on it at the moment. Then it is possible to make application specific authentication. Uh, you would do that so that you have some kind of secret handshake that you deal with your sensor. And then the sensor is convinced that yes, the counterpart is who they tell that they are and is actually allowed to access me. And then your uh, whatever services that you provide the data with would only be approved after the handshake is complete. And you can disconnect the BLE connection if that is not the case. To go even heavier is then possible to create, start encrypting the data memory. That is also possible. Uh, we are on purpose leaving all the encryption methods up to the client developers, all uh, the application developers. Meaning we don't want to be in the middle of you and your data, especially when it comes to encryption. It is better that it is all in your own hands and you can do it the way you want. Easy way to do it would be to have a simple encryption service that gets the data in from your data service, then provides you the encrypted uh, byte array, which then gets stored on the data memory using the data log. But there are other ways as well. That is completely up to you, and it is doable.
Then in the end, sorry, I'm just taking longer than I expected. There's the alternative communication methods that there was talk that, okay, how about other connections? So basically, what if I don't want to use the Android or iOS or even our mobile library to talk to the sensors? Or what if I can't? There's a couple of things. First of all, we have built in HRS, which is the heart rate service, the Bluetooth heart rate service. So if you provide heart rate information, you can very easily use that. Or the Nordic UART service, which is Nordic Semiconductor's own thing. The good thing is that the Nordic UART service, for example, you can easily try it out on your mobile phone with the Nordic Semiconductor's uh, NRF toolbox application. Uh, those are the kind of easy, they're limiting, rather limited in what they do, but it's easy to use. And especially if you don't need anything else, that's just fine. Then we have the kind of Swiss Army knife of uh, Bluetooth, which is called custom cat service. It is possible to create almost any kind of cat service. There are some limitations, but not many. Up to five characteristics. And we have a couple of samples that uh, create that use that. One is the custom cat SVC app, which provides, I think it was the medical temperature information. And then we have the new one called cat sensor data app, which uh, provide, creates a simple uh, custom protocol for accessing the sensor. And that one comes with the Python and web BLE clients so that basically Web BLE works at least on Google Chrome. And uh, the Python code as well should work on almost any computer that has the Python with Bluetooth support. And then one thing that these CAT services, they're just fine, they have, but they have the same limitation as our MDS has, meaning the Bluetooth limits the maximum simultaneous connections to seven. And on many phones, the maximum is lower than that. Typically, four, uh, four devices work more or less fine. Any more, and it gets more difficult. In those cases, when you want to have 10 or 20 or 30 sensors at the same time, one very neat trick is to have the processing done on the sensor in your sensor application. Calculate your kind of small amount of data, the result data there and then have the data embedded into the Bluetooth advertising packet. You can update it maximum maybe five times per second with new data, and that still gives you two packets uh, sent, two, uh, same packet sent, sent twice in case one of them is lost. So the data rate is not high, it's 100, 150 bytes per second maximum. But there's no limit on number of sensors. And it is very easy to receive these kind of messages with Raspberry Pi or mobile phone or a PC or Mac or whatever. All it needs to do is to be able to uh, listen to the Bluetooth advertising packages and handle the data that is contained inside them. And we have in the samples, we have a simple app that basically just have a running counter as a running counter there called custom BLE app. And that one will demonstrate on how to do it. Of course, in case you have the advertising packages going on in your custom packages, it doesn't matter. You can still connect to the sensor with, with our mobile library and access the data over the connection using the whiteboard protocols as well, or your own custom CAT services. They, they're not mutually exclusive. And here I have exactly the using multiple sensors, daily limitations. Another thing that can be limiting in, in addition to the Bluetooth and phone limitation of four to seven connections at the time is that the bandwidth can be limiting factor as well. So if you think that you're going to need to transfer a large amount of, let's say, accelerometer data with high speed from multiple sensors, 
it might be that you run out of bandwidth in the Bluetooth uh, band. And the, the maximum is relatively low. It's somewhere around maybe 50 to 60 kilobytes per second in practice. Theoretical is higher, but in practice, then you start to lose packages and the timings go off and so on. But if you have multiple sensors, this is something that is, for example, in our Stack Overflow, there's a couple of answers to this one and questions. Uh, comes that if you are recording data stream from multiple sensors, or if you are even maybe you don't stream them over the Bluetooth, you are recording them to data data logger, and then getting them afterwards. How to get the data synchronized? The good news is that each of the sensors has high accuracy clock that provides the timestamps. We call it relative time or timestamp, and it is given as milliseconds since reset. Of course, since different sensors are reset in different times, that alone doesn't give you anything. And then there is a small note that not all the hardware sensors, sensors in this sense, being accelerometer sensor or ECG, can provide accurate sample rates. In case uh, ECG actually does, but the ACC, gyro, and magnetometer, they have up to 10% error because the hardware limitation meaning different uh, moves and sensors can have different sample rates going on in their accelerometers. Even if you ask them all 104, in practice it can be somewhere 98 on one and 110 on the other. And you can put, uh, we have time service on the top level and you do put time and you can set the universal time for each sensor. That's important. Then the sensor knows what time it is. And then you can do get time detailed, which returns detailed information about the current time. And that one contains both UTC and the relative time, aka timestamp, on each sensor. So then you can get the mapping between the actual UTC time and the timestamp that is on each of the data updates. And here is something that many have asked is how to have a simple method for synchronizing multi-sensor data. First, set up the UTC time of each sensor using put time. Uh, do not do it once, meaning do it at least twice or three times if uh, before or when it's a new sensor that you are connecting to. Because on the first uh, request, there may be some metadata transfer going on at the same time that then skews the results a bit. So do it twice or three times, and then the last one is accurate. Accurate to a few tens of milliseconds. Then get time detailed on each sensor and store the difference to the, of the UTC and relative time. Then record the data, which has timestamps in it, like the accelerometer or ECG or your own data or whatever. And if your algorithm needs simultaneous samples from all the sensors, uh, and you use this kind of inaccurate sample rate data, then choose one of the sensors as master sensor and interpolate the others so that you get the, all data from the same time step. And if the recording time is really long, then the 20 ppm error of the, of the crystal on the moves and sensor can cause too much trip between the sensors. And you can repeat the step two and step one, should be one and two, in the end of the recording and compensate for the clock drift over the recordings between different sensors. They shouldn't drift too much if they're all in the same temperature. And it is the clock runs, the speed runs, uh, it depends on the temperatures. But if you are recording several hours, then it is a good idea to, to do that. And it's always a good idea, especially when in the middle of development, is to confirm the synchronization. For example, if you have two sensors, just tap them together. And you can see the spike. And if it matches on the data, in the data graphs that you make from your data, then you know that the synchronization is correct. Let's see. Finally, 
go to the last slide. Is there a question that I haven't answered in the middle? No. Okay, let's see. Starting from the MATLAB question, maybe. MATLAB. Mm. Oh, there's quite a lot of stuff there. Uh, no, that's already in the beginning. No, 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 no. Uh, about MATLAB, if I remember, I saw it on a glimpse. Uh, where is it possible to get data via MATLAB or any other regular Bluetooth LE connection? Uh, I think I already answered this, but if you look at the uh, GAT sensor data app sample, there you have a simple GAT interface that allows you to get that. So that is maybe the easiest way to get the sensor data over uh, to any non-mobile device from the sensor. Uh, can we somehow get the actual accelerometer sampling rate within, within the sensor? Yes, actually, if I share my desktop, where did I leave it? My my, 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 my. Where's my? Oh, there. That's on the screen. Too close. So let's see the accelerometer API. MEAS ACC YAML. We look here, we have info config. This talk about nominal sample rates. But here, Inside the subscription, we have ACC data. And if we look at the ACC data, it comes with a timestamp and an array of accelerometer samples. So if you take the difference between two updates, you get the timestamps. This timestamp difference between the two updates. And since you know how many samples is in single, uh, each update, then you can calculate the actual sample rate based on those. Look at that. Is put time say inside even if the sensor is disconnected or off? Uh, the put time when you set the UTC time, it stays on the sensor as long as the power is on. So basically, uh, it will stay there unless you switch it off. Uh, switching off the sensor depends on the app. For example, our plane app, which has no code whatsoever, that never switches off. Uh, the HR wake up app and the default firmware switch off if there's no data logger activity or mobile connection. And uh, basically, as long as it stays on, the UTC time stays on. It will lose some accuracy if a reset occurs. So if you run into an error state and the sensor resets itself, the clock will stay, but it will lose accuracy down to about plus minus 500 milliseconds. Uh, let's see what are the next questions. Is there a way to change the time mode before the sensor turns on or back? Back to sleep mode? Yes. Uh, uh, switching off the sensor and switching it on and what wakes it up are fully programmable. You cannot uh, change it from a mobile when, uh, if, for example, if there's an application that the HR, let's say HR wake up app is on the sensor, you cannot change it dynamically because the application decides how it's working. There are applications that don't switch off. There's HR wake up app and our default application, default firmware that do switch off and wake up with the heart rate studs. And they, I think they have one minute timeout. But you can easily just go and change the timeout value, build your own and flash your sensors, and then you have something else. Uh, or we have, uh, there's the move, what is the movement wake up app, which then, um, wakes up if the sensor moves. 
and so on. And it is not obligatory to put the sensor to power off mode. In many applications, it is important to keep the clock available. So uh, the sensor goes to relatively low power mode if you just switch off the Bluetooth advertising. So if in power off, you would use five microamps in the power on, but not advertising, you use 10. So yeah, it used twice the power, but it's still not much compared that you can still keep one single battery running for a year and a half or something. Average of... Yeah, if, if you need the uh, average value on the, on the mobile phone only, if you don't need the raw values, yeah, definitely, then it makes sense to do the calculation on the sensor. It will save a lot of power because the Bluetooth transmission is the high power consumption thing going on. So you'll use power doing that on the sensor. Yeah, the compass in my hobby project, I've actually implemented one compass right now. It is not as simple as one would think. So do we have a sample of it? Uh, we have something in the samples. Oh, or was it? No, we do not. It was in some other repository on this uh, Movesense community in the Bitbucket. There's some kind of the human compass that was uh, in some hackathon. Was that the Superman navigation or what was it? Oh, it could be. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But basically, in the magnetic field, you need to uh, reduce the bias, uh, kind of uh, subtract the bias. You have to do calibration on the on the bias first. And after that, it can be calculated. But you have to average out the, the data because there's quite a lot of noise in the typical magnetometer measurements. But if you, let's say, take two, uh, two averages per second or one average per second, you can get quite accurate reading. Any tips for debugging and profiling firmware with ease? We yeah. have a jig. OK, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, personally, I'm using Ozone, which came with this uh, J-Link Sager that I'm having. But it's quite bad program, meaning it's not very good. I haven't tried the GDP. I would even think that GDP plus some kind of nice UI would might even be better than the Ozone. Personally, I'm just using the RTT logs that come from the jig and uh, try to find out what's happening. The problem being that the Bluetooth stack on the motion sensor is relying on very accurate timing. And it has built-in system that if it loses the timing, for example, when the program sits in the breakpoint in a debugger, it resets the sensor. So you cannot step forward after stopping if you have Bluetooth transmission on board. So yeah, basically just RTT logs, uh, trying to understand the code, trying to make it as clear as possible, and then seeing what happens. Then we have a few questions here about, um, I think it's about the synchronization. So Conrad is asking, is there a way to figure out the exact sample rate of each sensor since it's not universal? I think he's using uh, more than one sensor in his application. And also here, uh, would the timestamp change if the sensor is disconnected or off? And how to sort two sensor data by timestamp? in real time so that the two sensors are time synced. So overall, this time syncing of several sensors yeah. is, is a topic. There's a big question. Uh, on the mobile side, the exact sample rate can be figured if you receive a few samples, a few notifications, data notifications. You can calculate the sample rate very accurately. Let's say over one second, there is a, you get enough samples that you can really see it quite accurate. And the timestamps are there, one millisecond accurate, so that should be fine. Just uh, the, uh, the synchronizing of multiple sensors is, uh, let me put 
take this sharing off. It's confusing me. First. So the synchronizing of the multiple data streams is such that the easiest way to do, in my opinion, is to receive maybe two or three samples per sensor. As after you have chosen, the, let's say, sensor one being the master sensor, then you just see in the, your last couple of uh, updates that you have gotten from all the other sensors that which ones on the UTC time hit where in the between of the master sample, uh, which samples are around it in the other sensors, and then you just basically take like linear interpolation. That should be accurate enough if your sample rate is high enough. Let's see. So I already asked this Janne's question. We are, are having a working on a version that will have more uh, memory, internal memory for logging data, not not yeah. for not not, yeah. not program memory, but but for data. Yeah, data memory. We have we are working on a prototype. We have the software kind of uh, alpha beta part. Uh, support for it is coming for 2.1. And that will have more data memory. The memory will behave a uh, bit differently because it is flash memory instead of and it will use more power. But there's 300 times more of it, so that helps a bit. Uh, good news is that the API stays the same. So if you're using data logger and logbook in your current application, there's a good chance that you don't need to change anything or you have to change a very little thing. Basically what is limiting is that you cannot fetch the data and write the data at the same time in the new send coming big memory variant. But other than that it works identical. Uh, Hendrik is also asking uh, about new hardware versions. These are I guess Bluetooth related. Yeah, at least not in the near future. I Meaning that would require different chips and that would mean full Bluetooth uh, certification and all that. So it's a big yeah. project to make completely new hardware. Yeah. And Mireya uh, is sometimes having problems connecting and getting data from the senders. Uh, what could be the reason? Could it be the battery? Yeah, uh, low battery level definitely causes disconnects. That is a known fact. And uh, usually it's a good idea to, to uh, measure, let's say, in the beginning of your operation, measure the, the battery level. And if it goes below, let's say, 20%, 15%, where the, then it starts to be a good time to uh, take the, uh, tell the user that, hey, change the battery. The problem is that the emptier the battery is, the more sensitive it is for high current use situations like data transfer over Bluetooth. So if the data transfer uses a lot of current, that means that the weak battery will fail at that point. Nordic specific features. Uh, theoretically, there should be a way to do it. It's going to be a bit inconvenient though since you have to have the exact same version of the SDK that we are using. And then you would be very uh, much tied to the exact version that we are using. Uh, there's some in the backlog, there's a feature that tells that, okay, expose this kind of settings on the, on the component APIs. And who knows, for some reason, uh, version of the framework, they might come out. We've chosen the zero DBM uh, in the sense that it gives quite good range uh, and it doesn't use ridiculous amount of pa um, battery power. Recommendations. There's an open source library for calculating orientation output. I know personally, uh, there's the, was the Valentin and Madwick algorithms. Both are available in CC++ code. Uh, uh, can't remember the exact site, but if you look at uh, with the term uh, AHRS attitude heading. Okay, you lost this. 
typing thing. Yeah, ARS algorithm. With that keyword, you should be able to find. And it's called Matwick. I can't remember the exact spelling. And uh, you can find ready-made C, C++ code for that open source. OK, in version 2.1, I think I already leaked a couple of features that are coming. Uh, one of them is the big memory support, uh, assuming we get our hardware completely out. The memory amount is one gigabit, so 128 megabytes. So that's that's a big. Uh, then the other thing is the we are hoping to get the per user bootloader uh, signatures, so that then you can have uh, per user locked bootloaders and applications, so that nobody can just take the SDK and just flash on the sensor whatever they want. It would be locked for you. Uh, lots of uh, little bug fixes, and uh, let's see. I'll take a quick peek. I hope I'm not sharing the screen now. I'll have a quick look at through the backlog so I can see what I can tell you right away. Bug fix, bug fix, and bug fix. Um, uh, one big thing for medical and uh, heart rate users is that there's going to be leads of detection. So during the measurement, you'll get information if the leads have been disconnected or not. Uh, some data logger bug fixes. Mm. Uh, for the third party mo uh, uh, modules, software modules that we have, or algorithm modules that have been available since 1.8, I think, the, there's going to be a possibility to uh, releasing binary modules, which means that you can pre-compile the modules and just give the binary to, the cust to your customers and not the source code. It's going to be quite handy. And... Uh, Still, uh, some more bug fixes. Yeah, so that's basically it on the on the new features. Yeah, uh, uh, are people interested in looking at the simulator thing? I think I was supposed to, I thought I had it in my slide set, but I either skipped it over because I had to forward a backward. But I can show it right now if people are interested. Okay. Okay, yes, please. So, yeah. so let me share this, share my desktop. Since I'm using a Mac, that means that I have to do a remote desktop to my Office PC, which I have ready here. And here I have created the demo folder as well. I have the device library, just like in the demo folder on the Mac side. And here, again, I will create a build file, build folder. And then I'll just open it. I like to use the git bash in the windows. Same CMake, Visual Studio 15, 2000, 2017. We tried 2019, but there were some 64-bit things that prevented it from working properly. And here we don't need to put the toolchain file. Just the Visual Studio is enough. We put MoveSense core library. Did 
device library and put it here. And then we choose the application that we want to use. Um, more sense device library samples. Let's use the same blinky that we had earlier. And that should do it. Now, after this, we don't have to touch the CMake at all. We go to the build sim. And here, it has actually built us a full Visual Studio project and solution. So, project SLN, double click it. And here we have the project. Here, inside the MoveSense project, we have source files. And it now has the Blinky client, which is the application that we just chose. So you can edit this here and deal with it and so on. All you need to do is to select the MoveSense as the startup project. Make sure that you have Windows 32. Debug is handy. And you can have run it as a, in a local Windows debugger. And sooner or later, we should have a running sensor software here. And if you can see the fancy UI, there's a blinking LED, that red and black area there. Now, blinking LED is nice, but how to get the sensor data and so on? We use the WBCMD command that I had earlier. Yeah. If you just type it, you'll get the instructions on what kind of common parameters it takes. And to talk to that simulator, you have to set the port. And instead of the usual COM4 or whatever your serial port is, you put the TCP and then the local host address. And because I always forget what the port is, you can actually uh, see it here in the startup. Where is it? Listening to port. Hmm. Where was it? Port 7809. So 7809. And now if we do path slash info, which is kind of the first contact that we take to our sensor, it answers us that here we are, we are a move sense. The ECSI means simulator. So it has a simplified serial. It's running our framework 2.0, which is the one that I downloaded from the Bitbucket and so on. Now, if I would ask for accelerometer data, let's say 13 Hertz, but we cannot get it. We have to do the operation subscribe. Now we get the accelerometer data. This one is just, if we have not given it any kind of data in, if I stop it with the ESC, you can see that it's basically just giving more or less the same sample that looks like 1G in the Z direction. Or was it alternating between two? I can't remember. But uh, you can open, uh, you can create a CSV file that has the data. And then this can load it if it's in the same folder where the XA is running. So this way you can try your application. And let me see if I have that. Okay, let's switch off our blinking thing here. Just to show you that now that I killed that app, now if I do the same thing, it will not give anything. 
But yeah, it's very easy. You, here you can put breakpoints and everything home as much as you want. The limitations of a simulator is that you cannot do anything related to BLE. Uh, and the timings are not 100% similar, meaning there are some timing differences. And so but you can try most of your algorithm development and do it in the simulator. Uh, any more questions about the simulator? Okay, it looks like uh, we we covered most of the questions. Oh, can can it transmit data over Bluetooth? The simulator. The simulator cannot. It can yeah. only transmit over the over the the TCP port over uh, using the whiteboard protocol. So nothing that relates to Bluetooth. It doesn't work there. It's not included. Okay, no. then I would say. Uh, we have covered more or less what we wanted today. Uh, hopefully it was useful for all of you. And uh, yes, see you tomorrow then in uh, uh, in the next session that covers mobile programming for MooSense. And uh, yeah. Hope you enjoyed and uh, and uh, and maybe if, if you still had something that that you think we should cover tomorrow that from today's part then then uh, uh, maybe send us an email before or or just uh, just be prepared to to include that in in the questions tomorrow and uh, yeah just enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are in the world we we had the really international. Uh, session today and uh, and try out what you learned and uh, and and hopefully you've got uh, a number of new apps running by by the session tomorrow so yes wishing uh wishing a nice nice day for everyone and uh see you again tomorrow yeah same from my side bye bye i don't know if i'm visible yes i am Okay, so Pedro, five, sauna next. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, excellent idea. But yeah, see you tomorrow, those of you uh, who join us and those of who who can't make it. Uh, it was nice having you here. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure that if you just send email to Perho later on, you can organize something. If yes. your program, uh, if your project runs into a snag and you can't go forward. Please let us know and we'll help you all we can. And and we will share the recording and we will share the slides as well. So so that will be available later. Okay. See you yeah. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.